I can prove to you that I know um, the, the sort of I know a smart contract that hashes to this short hash, and I know inputs to the smart contract that such that it evaluates to true or whatever that allows you me to send some money without giving you any information what the inputs to the smart contract are or what, even what the smart contract is. So all of these things are possible. Um, there's sort of we have this what I'll talk about later a little bit is, are these proofs of solvency. As an exchange, I can convince you that I'm solvent. As a Bitcoin bank, I can convince you that I'm solvent without giving you any information why I'm solvent or even like telling you how much money I, the bank stores in total. <coughs> and um, these proofs actually have an additional property, or they can have an additional property. I can convince you of some very very complicated statement using a short proof. So I can convince you that sort of this blockchain is valid, that all the transactions in this blockchain are, is valid using a proof that is 288 bytes long. So what does this mean? I can just give you the header of the blockchain, one block of the blockchain, and uh, this one block of the blockchain, and then I give you a proof that sort of everything that happened before was valid, and there was like, you know, so much proof of work, or so much proof of stake, and put into this blockchain. And you will be convinced, given this 188 byte proof, that this is actually a true stake. And um, so this can be used for, say, blockchain compliance. Some of these applications are more practical, some of them are more theoretical, right? Like, it would be actually quite hard to create such a proof. But in theory, there's nothing stopping us from doing it. So how does this zero knowledge proof knowledge, this magical tool, uh, how, did, how could this conceivably work? And I want to demonstrate this on an example of Stuck, which we all probably know. <coughs> um, and the, the fact is that Sudoku you know, it might seem like a toy example, right? If I can, right? I want to convince you that I know a solution to the Sudoku without giving you even a single number in the Sudoku, a single number of the real solution in the Sudoku. And, and I'm going to show you that I can do this. And you will be convinced that I know a solution, but you will have no idea, other than you can solve it yourself. But if you don't, uh, you, you will learn nothing else than what you could have derived yourself. And the reason why Sudoku is interesting, and not just a toy example, is because it's something called, what you call in cryptography, you can, sort of, you can do this for bigger size Sudokus, and it turns out that you can actually state sort of any interesting problem, and, and formally this is called any problem in NP, um, where the verification is efficient, right? If I have to give you the solution, it's easy to check that the solution is correct. Any problem where, the, where checking that the solution is correct, if this is efficient, then I can formulate it as a Sudoku. So if I give you a zero knowledge proof of knowledge protocol for Sudoku, then you sort of have a zero knowledge proof of uh, knowledge pro protocol, not a very efficient one, but <coughs> we have one for everything that has an efficient verifier. Every problem that is in MP is a problem. Okay. So let's consider the Sudoku, and well, here's the solution to it, um, which took me it's embarrassing not to figure out. But um, the question is like, say we have this following scenario, and 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 you know. Uh, Victor asks, like, hey, Peggy, can you help me with the Sudoku? And, and Peggy is kind of mean and says, like, yeah, I'll leave you pay me. Uh, and Peggy, uh, Victor will do that, but like only if Peggy really knows a solution first. And you can implement this in the blockchain as a sort of atomic exchange, and this is called a zero knowledge contingent payment. I pay you if you, in zero knowledge, prove first that you have actually what, what I want to convince you. So, okay, how can, how can uh, we do this? Well, the first thing that we are going to do, or that Peggy is going to do is, she's going to randomize the Sudoku. So she's going to draw some random permutation. So every number in the Sudoku gets replaced with a random other number, okay? So two gets replaced with six, and five with three, and so on. And, and then we have a different Sudoku which, but what you will notice is that, is that, that the different Sudoku is sort of inherently equivalent, right? You just switch out the numbers, but it's equally hard as the previous one, right? If I give you a solution for the previous one, and you know the sort of transition table, then you directly have a solution for the old one. So, right, like, the important thing is that this randomization problem is that 
does not make the, 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 the problem any sort of easier. It's, it's actually exactly the same problem. But, um, so how can we do this? Well, so the Sudoku both people have, have sort of the not filled out Sudoku in the sky, or they know it. And then what Peggy's going to do is she's going to randomize it, and then she's going to send the randomization table and the uh, Sudoku to, to Victor, but she can't do it like this, right? Because this would already, we have no, like, you know, now Victor would have the solution. So what we're going to do is put a piece of paper on both of these things. Okay, we're going to put them in the room and put a piece of paper, or put them in the lockbox or something. But pieces of paper are easier to imagine with, with Sudoku. Because the next thing that is going to happen, and um, so what, what this piece of paper does is that Peggy can now not change what she wrote down, right? She's written it down, she put a piece of paper on it, let's say it's in, it's in the room. Uh, she cannot change, so it's, it's what we call it's binding. Uh, she cannot change what she wrote down. But it's also hiding in that it hides what uh, what she wrote down, right? It's completely hiding, you cannot see what it is. There's a black screen in front of it. And then what Victor can do is he can ask some specific question. Like he can ask, open row number four. And um, uh, Peggy can open the row number four. Okay. And the interesting thing is what Victor can then check is that it's a little bit small, but that there's sort of nine different numbers. That this, this row is internally consistent. Right? If, if, sort of the, if she had cheated everywhere, then this row would not have nine numbers in it. But if this joke is correct, then there have to be nine different numbers in some order. And it's, it's really some random order because we have this randomization step that we did before, right? So you, you just see, like, Victor checks whether there are nine different numbers in there. And um, what he could also do is he could ask different questions. He could ask for a column. Again, he would check for nine different numbers. He could ask for a box, and the fourth question he could ask is sort of see the original puzzle. So look at the randomization table, and look at sort of the original squares of the puzzle, and check that this is consistent with the puzzle that uh, he actually wanted uh, Peggy to solve. Okay? And you, you can just go through the permutation table, table and see whether the uh, original puzzle and the permutation table gives you the new puzzle. Okay, so so what happens now? Well, Victor is going to ask one of these questions. He's going to ask for one row, or one column, or one box, or for the original puzzle. But Peggy doesn't know which one it is. And if you think about it, if Peggy cheated, if the she didn't have a solution, then there must have been at least one row, or one column, or one box, that sort of didn't have nine uh, different elements in it. It didn't, wasn't a solution. Or she used an easier puzzle, which you would have figured out in this step. So um, you can do the math, and, and you can actually figure out that if Peggy cheated, then with probability uh, 27 over 28, or at least that probability, if she only cheated in a single spot, then with probability 1 over 28, we would have caught her. Okay? So there's 28 sort of different scenarios in which you could have cheated. You can actually do a better analysis on this, but like it, at the very least, one in 28 cases uh, that we would have caught her. Okay? So there's some probability which we, with which we would have caught, or uh, Victor would have caught a, a cheating peg. So he's sort of 128 convinced that, uh, which is not very high, but you know, He's like sort of like with three percent probability, he um, would have caught a cheating Peggy. However, if Peggy was honest and she actually had a solution, then no matter what Victor had asked, he would have uh, convinced um, uh, she would have convinced Peg, uh, Victor that if, you know whatever question she could have answered sort of correct. And that what, then what we can do is we can repeat this whole process. Okay. So we, she can ask, uh, say Victor can ask questions, uh, question over question. And so every time you ask another question, because they're independent from each other, the, the probability of catching a cheating penny will grow exponentially. So after two tries, you know, we're, um, 
So the probability that achieving Peggy will succeed is like is 92%. After 10 tries, it's like 70%. And after 1,000 tries, it's like, you know, insanely small. Like the one in a uh, it's billion, trillion, quadrillion, or whatever. I don't know. But after a thousand tries, Victor knows the solution of this too. Very good point. After a thousand tries, like even after two tries, you know the solution, right? You see this randomized puzzle, but I just told you that from this randomized puzzle, I can actually extract like the the, the, the original one. So uh, how can we can uh, how can we prevent that? Well, what we do is that in every step. We do this again a thousand times, but in every step we use a new randomization. So in every step, Peggy thinks of a new random table and sends over, throws away the old, uh, the old thing that she wrote down, and sends over a new one. And what you will learn is that what you will uh, be able to see is that um, sort of uh, that no matter. In every round, all that uh, Victor will see is the numbers 1 through 9 in a random order. Because the permutation is different, because the shuffling happens in every round, all that Victor will see is the numbers 1 through 9, right? The one, yeah. But how do you know that Becky used that particular arrangement in the solution? Because Victor could also ask for, uh, he could also ask for, well, Okay. Because you could also ask to see the permutation and the original puzzle. So if 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 Peggy cheated on, she could use it in an easier puzzle, right? And then she could like very easily, you know, answer all the row and the column and the box queries. But there's also this original query where you get to see <coughs> the original permutation. Again, this doesn't leak any information. All I'm seeing is that the original puzzle was used. However, it convinces you that if, if Peggy didn't use the original puzzle, then uh, <laughs> then we would have caught her with some probability. And because we can repeat this over and over again, we get more and more convinced that Peggy actually knows the solution. However, because Peggy randomizes in every round, we have no sort of there's no information that actually gets leaked to Victor. These answers are always just one through nine. And in fact, you can one way to think about this, say Peggy and Victor do this game, and we're standing in the room observing what they're doing. Okay? Are we afterwards convinced that Peggy uh, actually has a solution? Like, are we, as observers of this game, are we convinced that, that Peggy has a solution? Well, only if we trust that Peggy and Victor don't collude. If Peggy and Victor colluded, it would be extremely easy for them to pretend like they are playing this game, they're playing this verification game, where in fact they're just colluding, right? Like Pe Victor just tells uh, Peggy, like, you know, hey, I'm gonna ask for row number seven, and then all that Peggy has to do is make sure that row number seven is okay, and um, and they can sort of simulate well, the, the technical term is that they can simulate a correct execution of the protocol. And what that means is that sort of if we as an outside observer learn nothing, then there's sort of there cannot be any knowledge that is actually transmitted in this protocol. So uh, Victor really learns nothing about what the solution is, other than that there is a solution, right? It could be a pseudo solution. We know after the fact, but you know, there has to be with extremely high probability, there has to be a solution, and also that Peggy knows. Uh, what is a uh, round? Like, how, how often do we shuffle this? After every question, or? After every question. We have to, it's important. Even if we use sort of, in, in two questions, if we use the same permutation, then you would learn some sort of information. Then you might learn, like, say you open, you know, the first row and the first column, and you see a seven here and a seven up there, then you know some sort of correlation between, you know that if the seven is down there, or the number that is down here, it has to be the same number up there. So, but if we shuffle in every round, then uh, if we so if we re-randomize in every round, then there's no information that is being transmitted. But then why wouldn't Peggy just make up every answer, right? Like Victor asks, give me one row, and she just randomly because gives. Because she first in every round 
she first writes down the whole solution and the permutation. She has to write it down so under the, the top row and put a piece of paper on it. Uh -huh. Such that if she could see the question and then change her answer, then she could make it up, right? But the important thing is that she cannot change her answer after uh, she has written down the thing. So you can never ask for uh, the permutation table and a row or a column or a box, right? Because that would give away information. So you say again? You can you, you can't, in a round, you can only ask for one thing. You can't ask for the permutation mapping and a row. No, that would already that give would you give information. The answer. Okay, so it's only okay. one of them. Exactly. Things. It's very important that it's only one thing. And that this one thing itself does not give you any information because it's just the numbers one for nine. It's sort of uniformly distributed, right? <clears throat> it's not obvious to me that like if you keep writing down like rows like just scanning it, but you know from top to bottom and writing down what the rows with the shuffle of like encryption uh, are that you gain no like you can't like somehow statistically infer some properties of her solution and that no knowledge is legal. Okay. Is there like an intuitive way to understand why why you can't do some kind of clever statistical trick? Okay. Figure out how I'm going to repeat the questions we early on, I think. So the question is, why do you not learn anything yeah. uh, when you just look at this one row? Well, the thing is, if you think about it, so say the row is uh, 1 through 9. Okay. Say it's like just the row, like what, uh, iterated 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. But then if the, the permutation table is chosen randomly, then really with this each outcome has the same probability. Every possible combination of numbers, like given whatever, if I don't know the permutation table, every possible outcome has exactly the same probability. <coughs> and like maybe you know, it makes sense to run through with this for, for like numbers one to three, right? And then just think about all the different permutation tables that exist, and then you see that sort of the outcome will be equally distributed among all, you know, all orderings of one, two, three. So you can just, uh, yeah, just sort of do that, play that exercise, and then uh, the same holds true for one, three. Where does uh, Peggy get her uh, randomness from? Uh, the question is, where does Peggy get her randomness from? Well, so in 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 uh, that's a good question. Where do you get your randomness from? But she has some sort of private source of entropy, like right, and if she is a computer, then. Uh, when you start up, your computer sort of you measure times with how uh, you know how fast is the startup, how you measure different temperatures, and you try to get some sort of source of entropy. But you know this is sort of the, the randomness for Peggy. It's very important that that is private. If her randomness was not private, then it would be easy to sort of you know reverse engineer what she's doing. So, and actually in practice, a lot of attacks, you know, attack bad sort of, they call like pseudo-random number generators, attack sort of in, improper or insecure pseudo-number random, pseudo-random number generators. Um, but yeah, this is sort of, you know, in all of cryptography, um, you need to have some sort of minimal secret, and that secret is usually just sort of some sort of entry, or some sort of randomness. How do you know that she didn't just write in a number in every box, but that every number, like every row follows the rules of okay. or, or that her solution follows the rules, sorry. Well, so, I mean, if she has a solution, then it's the solution, right? Like, then she, she actually solved the problem. Well, like, how do you know that it's just not, like, the, the numbers? So, I think what you're asking is why didn't, why did she use an easier Sudoku puzzle? Yeah. Like, sort of the end puzzle. Well, this is what the original question is for, where you can actually, right, the victor can ask for, uh, to see what the permutation table and the puzzle and verify that this corresponds to the original puzzle. So uh, Peggy might do that, and then most of the questions she can answer correctly, but whenever Victor asks this question, well, then she will be screwed, and then, uh, yeah. And then since Victor can, can sort of, she doesn't know what Victor is going to ask, there will be with some, with some probability, she will get screwed on that question. And because we repeat so often, it is very likely that she will, at one point, we will catch her, or Victor will catch her. So Victor's randomness is also equally important, because he needs to be able to ask random questions. And Victor's randomness is somewhat important, yeah. It's, uh, we'll actually see later on why it's not 
why that's important, but it's very sort of it's important <laughs> that Peggy cannot <coughs> predict Victor's randomness. If Peggy could predict Victor's randomness, then she could cheat easily. But see, you can never get a deterministic answer with this. It's always going to be like some small epsilon probability remaining of you not knowing for sure. Um, or is it possible to actually? Uh, you can. I think there are protocols. It's different kind of. So this is a sort of a protocol with what we call statistical soundness. So you can get it as, as small as possible. I think there's other protocols that would achieve you perfect soundness. But then, um, sort of the zero knowledge property would only be statistical or computational. But that's a piece of. But you know, the thing is, like, in, in due to the uh, like these numbers, you can make them as small as possible, and it really, like, you know, a couple more rounds, and it, it, it uh, grows very fast, it grows exponentially. Okay, I think. Uh, any more questions at this point? Okay. So uh, this is. What is your knowledge proof of knowledge? And uh, right, you use a new permutation every round, and then you know we reshuffle the permutation, and then sort of a different question gets asked. So um, this one kind of zero knowledge proof. Um, there's actually other zero knowledge proofs for sort of more in, in the more cryptographic round, uh, which also don't have a thousand rounds, but this is a one round. To the, well, actually, three round protocol, what we would call this. And um, so the question is Peggy has wants to prove that she knows that she has a private key to, say, a Bitcoin public key. Okay? But what does a public key look like? Well, a public key is an element in, in a group, but basically, what you can think of is this uh, y such that g to the x equals y modulo some large prime. And it turns out that given y and g, it is very hard to compute x. This is called, it's like the, the, the discrete logarithm problem. And that's what the security of sort of all the cryptocurrencies that are out there re uh, relies on. Um, and, and a lot of other stuff that you use every day. Um, but the important thing is that given x and g, I can just compute g to the x and, and I very easily compute the public key y. So y is the public key and x is the private key, okay? So uh, there's this asymmetric, asymmetric relationship between given the private key, I can compute the public key, but given the public key, I cannot compute the private key, okay? Uh, so uh, what is the private key used for? Well, the private key sort of gives you the authorization to spend your cryptocurrency. So given the private key, I can compute, uh, I, can, I can say sign a message, cryptographically sign a message, and authorize that money, like the public key is the address, and the private key is the sort of the information that gets used to then spend the money. <coughs> um, so what if I want to convince you that I actually know that this is my private key, right? And I don't want to, I clearly don't want to send you my private key, because then you can just spend from my Bitcoin address. But I want to convince you, you know, that this public key where, you know, this Bitcoin address where there's a million dollars or whatever is mine. And so how can I do that without giving you my private key. Well, um, what I can do is, as, as Peggy, I, I draw a random number, again, this sort of random set that's sort of inherent to your knowledge, and I send you g to the r, which is just a random, you know, a random group element, but again, from g to the r, it's hard to compute r, right? Um, so, so Victor is a, and then a sends a random challenge, which is again a random number c, uh, and this random challenge does not, you know, it's, it's just one, some random number. And then what Peggy computes is this S, which is R plus C times, well, this should be an X. So C times my private key X, um, and uh, then sends this over to, to uh, Victor. So now what Victor checks, now we have to do a little bit of algebra, what does Victor check? He check computes g to the x. So if Peggy was honest, then um, this g to the x is exactly equal to, well, it's g to the x is g to the r plus c times y. So uh, it's actually equal to uh, c times x, sorry. It's actually equal to this a, which I sent in the first round, times 
y, which is supposedly g to the x, to the power of c. And um, the important step, though, the, yeah, so this is sort of, you know, this written out, uh, you can see that, that both sides actually have to be equal. And write that g to the r times g to the x times c, you can add the things in the exponent, the exponent and uh, you, you get that the information is that this is done correctly. And it turns out that, um, and this is called the sigma protocol, but it turns out and that if Victor had sent two challenges C, okay, so C1 and C2, and uh, Peggy had responded with two answers X, so S1 and S2, then uh, it's actually very easy to see that Victor could have directly computed x. He would have known x, like, right? So, but however, the, the actual value s does not reveal any information about x. Why is this the case? The case because there's this randomizer r in there, okay? And this randomizer r actually means that the value s is sort of, you know, just some uniformly random uh, value. But what I really wanted to show you in this protocol is that this is an interactive protocol, right? Again, just as the other one, this is an interactive protocol. So, you know, Peggy talks to S, uh, uh, and sort of in the blockchain, this is not a very realistic setting, right? You don't have interaction in the blockchain. I just want to post the transaction, and then if you approve on what the protocol is. Well, <coughs> isn't this more complicated than it needs to be? So, for example, if Victor has a public key, he could just send a bunch of secrets to Peggy multiplied by the public key that she supposedly has a private key for, and then she can she can multiply by the inverse on her side, multiply by his public key, and send them over to him. So I'm not able to pass that program. Okay, okay. So I'm pretty sure that. Uh, I mean, we can talk about this later offline, but um, I don't think that just by randomizing the problem is then like if if I just you know randomize it then. Like, I really need to convince you that this is the correct value, right? And this is exactly what this protocol does. But yeah. Why would she create another address, send, that, send some value to that other address, and then that would be a proof that she owns the initial right. address? Right. So that's, uh, that is, in essence, that is exactly the same thing. Because we can see that this, well, I will show you in a second how to turn this into something called a signature. And what I do is, when I send money, is I give you a signature under my address. Okay, so under my public key, I give you a signature for that public key. So this will be basically what she's doing. Then is almost exactly this, um, but without having to spend the transaction fee. And um, but the important thing is, right? Like, so we can't really use this in the blockchain setting as is. Why? Because it is interactive, right? There's, there's sort of this verify victor. And we need to make sure, as in the previous protocol, that Victor does you know, his job correctly. So we could designate someone to, uh, uh, to, to, to these zero knowledge proof of knowledge for, for every participant. But you know, again, then we would have a central party. And that sort of goes against the paradigm uh, uh, of, of decentralized blockchains. So what can we do instead? Well, what we would really want is that Peggy could just write a proof could just write down a single proof without interaction, and everybody can check that proof and check that it is correct. So what we want is a non-interactive zero-knowledge proof of knowledge in this. And so the way that we do that is we have to sort of replace this randomness from the verifier with something that is more uh, non-interactive. And what we can do is we can just replace it with a hash function. So what we do is we hash the first message and, and the, the y and this will give us, if the hash function is a good hash function, this will give us a random value. But the important thing, uh, the reason why we're doing this is that once you change the value A, then you will change the value C because it gives you a different hash, right? And it turns out that you would actually need to sort of be able to, to uh, predict the hash function or invert the hash function, which we assume is hard, right? A hash function that is, again, a function that is easy to compute one way, but hard to invert. So we would have to be able to invert the hash function to be able to break this. Because, again, 
he first wrote down the randomization. This is like, in this book, what we would do is you write down your randomization table and, and put the paper on it, and then we have some sort of way of hashing this and getting a random number out of it. And this is exactly what we're doing here. So we're getting a, a random number um, out of the first message. Well, but now it turns out that we don't need the verifier anymore. <coughs> Because we don't need the interaction with the verifier anymore. Because Peggy can just uh, compute this hash herself, right? She doesn't. She knows what the hash function is. She can just compute this herself. And what she then does is we change the protocol such that Peggy computes the challenge herself, and then sends over the the sort of the A value, the the commitment, the challenge, and the S value. And then when uh, Victor checks the proof, he checks the same thing as before, but more importantly, he also checks that the challenge was computed correctly. So he checks that Peggy actually did the right job when applying the hash function. And if she didn't, then we would just reject uh, the set of the So the, the nice thing is now that, that, that Victor can do this, everybody can do this, right? If I write down this proof, I can put this on the blockchain, and everybody can check that this proof is done correctly. So in this special case, we actually call this a signature, right? This the proof of knowledge of a private key is a signature. Because we hash the, the message that we want to sign. And the message can be, I want to send some money from my account to your account, from my Bitcoin address to your Bitcoin address. This is the message there. And as long as we hash that as well, then uh, we get a signature. Proof, why do you need the challenge to be a hash of uh, some input of cookies? Like, why can't the challenge just be any number, even in the non-interactive one? Well, so the problem is, that say the, it is just any number, you know, the digits of pi, right? They look sort of random. Well, the problem is then, uh, then the prover would know beforehand what the challenge is, okay? So think about it in the Sudoku. The, if the challenge sort of corresponds to questions, and we derive these questions from the digits of pi, which are assumed to look random, then, uh, then she would know exactly what questions were going to be asked. Well, and we just had these questions in the discussion that if she knew what these questions would be, then she could answer, uh, then she could create a fake proof, right? Then she could like sort of make sure that she can answer those questions, but nothing else. But once she computes the hash, she knows the challenge anyways, right? Yeah, but the hash depends on, uh, the hash depends on her first message. That's the important property. So she can sort of, you know, she could, uh, she would have to change her first message to be able to achieve. But then again, the challenge is different. So she can play this game over and over again, but with very high probability, she will not be able to find one uh, where she actually succeeds. So why can't you just, like, Victor send a, a smart contract address that uh, Peggy sends some Ether to and the smart contract automatically refunds that Ether back and shows that in order for her to transmit that, that she has well, to obviously have a private key. I'm, what I'm saying is that, well, how does Ethereum know, how do the Ethereum miners know that sort of sending the money from your address, that you were authorized to send it? You have to have the private key to send it. Yeah, how do you prove that you have the private key? Is it sending proof because you wouldn't be able to send unless you have the private key? How? Why? How? How do I show? How do I convince the miners that I have the private key? Send a number. You say at, on a Tuesday, I'm going to send 0 0.0009521 from that address. If it happens, the likelihood of it happening, the way I said it, would be on that. But like, I need to, so the problem is, I need to, the, 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 the address is, the, the blockchain is, is, you know, it's in the sky, and, and they, it's what the blockchain is, is just a ledger and in its simplest form. It's just a map between these public keys and the addresses. And I need to be able to uh, somehow convince the miners, right? Like one important property is that I need to be able to convince the miners that I control one of these uh, public keys. And the way I do that is exactly this protocol. It is This is literally what... Well, Bitcoin doesn't currently use this. They use a variant of it, but they're going to switch to exactly this protocol. So I need to write, because I need to be able to say, uh, I am the owner. There's no sort of center party where I signed up, right? Like a blockchain is decentralized. 
it's not like a bank where I sign up with my passport and I can later on come in with my passport and, and you know like convince you that you know I am the actual owner of this account. There's sort of no there's no real world identities tied to to an address. I can just come up with a new address, right? I can come up with a new public key by thinking of a private key and just computing the public key. But then later on, I need to be able to convince the world. I need to be able to convince miners, and I need to be able to convince miners, uh, everyone, that I am the rightful owner of this address. And what I do is I do exactly this protocol. I basically provide a zero knowledge proof of knowledge of the private key. And um, so this is like when you're saying like a solution like this, this is just a more complicated version of this, right? For any transaction in a cryptocurrency, unless it's completely broken, I will have to give you a signature. Uh, can you explain the benefits of uh, adopting short signature on to Bitcoin over the currency? And I don't really want to get topic. It's like you know, it's, it's a little bit faster, more efficient, uh, as I'm next part. We can talk about that um, Why was there uh, issues with Ether Delta when people were signing their transactions? Uh, I think it was back in December, um, saying that if you, you you were signing your transaction, it was uh, with your MetaMask account, it was uh, uh, putting some vulnerability in the process, and people could do. Uh, I honestly don't know. I think the signature. Probably what happened was that the signature algorithm in some way was broken. So, you know, like for example, they if if they didn't hash the A there correctly, or there's you know, there's many different signature algorithms and there's many ways to break they, they just redirected it to a phishing site on December. Oh okay. That's what they did, yeah. so yeah, so they <laughs> people didn't actually interact with the blockchain and yeah, apparently it They was just stole the private keys. Oh they yeah. just stole the private keys. They took it to a phishing site or something. Oh, okay. Well, so the problem is, right, like if you give your private key away, so, and I'll talk about that later, if you store your Bitcoin or your cryptocurrency on an exchange, you don't actually have control of your own Bitcoin, right? That exchange has control of the Bitcoin and you're in a business relationship and hope that with the exchange and hope that they're handling your money correctly. And, and if you enter your sort of, and the same thing if you enter your uh, mm -hmm. private key somewhere online and like MetaMask or whatever, uh, you hope that that side is handling your private key correctly and doesn't just go off and send you money somewhere else. And apparently, if, uh, what Charles is saying is that uh, you know people just got directed to the phishing side from from an attacker, entered their private key there, and then obviously the attacker could just send the money off to whoever he wants to. But yeah, any any other questions? Okay, so. Um, I want to talk about now a specific zero knowledge group of knowledge called bulletproofs, uh, which we developed here at Stanford uh, and together with uh, people from UCL and, and sort of some of the Bitcoin core developers. And uh, this, um, uh, this zero knowledge group has special properties that make it explicit, uh, very usable for the blockchain. So, um, this goes back to something that I mentioned in the beginning, which are these confidential transactions, right? So, you know, this is a, this is a Bitcoin transaction. There is some input, <coughs> some output. You know, Ethereum looks slightly different, but it's basically the same. All the other cryptocurrencies, like the, the core thing, is the same. And uh, the important property of a Bitcoin transaction is that the sum of the inputs is greater or equal to the sum of the outputs. So no new money is created. And actually, the difference between the inputs and the outputs is the fee. Okay? So this is the money that uh, goes to the miners for verifying the transaction. So what do miners check when the transaction is, is, is sent? Well, they check the signature is correct. So this is what we just talked about. They check that the person who's sending the money was actually authorized to send the money. They check that the inputs are spent, so you cannot spend the same money twice. Um, and thirdly, they check this condition that I just talked about, that the sum of the inputs is equal to the sum of the outputs plus the inputs. So what is the problem with that, with these transaction amounts being available in the field? 
Well, everybody can see the pair, the pay, and the value. You don't actually see sort of the real world identity of who the pay and the pay are. You just see these addresses. But it turns out it's actually not that hard. And there's been a lot of sort of research in their companies that spend a lot of time in de-anonymizing these addresses. And you know, at, at a very high level, like if I know sort of your address, then I can see on the blockchain what other money is going there. And then I can also trace sort of what addresses are connected with each other, and through that infer, like say I know only one of your addresses, but then you will spend from that address to another of your addresses, so I can sort of infer uh, what which money on the blockchain you control. And you know, there's companies doing this, and this is one of the reasons why the FBI actually really likes the blockchain because they can sort of track all these, you know, all these dark websites. Uh, they can like pretty, they've done a pretty good job at, at being able to track. Um, uh, sort of people running um, in, in heist. And the other thing that you see is the value, right? Like, let's assume, you know, I know your address um, and I can see your value. Well, what does this mean? Say I get my salary in, in some future world, I get it in Bitcoin, or I work with a Bitcoin salary, I get it now in Bitcoin. Uh, this means that my salary is public on the blockchain, right? Everybody will be able to see how much I'm getting. Um, and you know most people would not want that. The other thing is, say I'm a company and I'm paying my, I run my supply chain on the blockchain. You know, this has been proposed a lot. Well, if everybody can see how much I'm paying my suppliers, this is an important business secret. You know, say I'm buying um, some, you know, the tires. I'm Ford and I'm buying tires from my suppliers, and you know I don't want to uh, say how much I'm paying each one. Right, this is you know Michelin and Ford are very they want to they have some private negotiations and it's important that this information stays private. Um, and even if I don't right, like care about hiding who I'm paying, right? Usually when I'm trying to hide who I'm paying, say, you know, like if I'm if I'm paying a drug site, I might want to hide that. If I'm uh, political, you know, political asylum and sending money or if I'm sending money from Cuba to North Korea or whatever, I want to hide that. Um, but like even if I don't care about that, I really don't think that I would want my my sort of on the blockchain cut like how much I'm sending, right? Even if I don't care about revealing who I'm paying, I would like to hide what I'm paying. And one easy way to see this is 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 Venmo, right? Everybody here uses probably Venmo, and in the public node you can see who is paying whom, but you cannot actually see how much is being paid. So. Um, what can we do? Well, again, we can sort of use a similar trick that we've done in the other protocols. We can hide the amount using something called a, a cryptographic commitment or an encryption of the amount. So then the amount is, is not visible anymore in the peer. But what is the problem with that? Well, the problem is how do we check this condition that we've talked about, right? How do we check that the inputs are greater or equal to the outputs? And actually, there's another question that turns out to be even more difficult to answer. I need that the outputs are both positive, right? Otherwise, you know, if I have five Bitcoin incoming and I have minus 10 outcoming, then sort of the other one would be plus 50. So it's actually really important that you also check the second condition, which is sort of so easy to check in the clear, but now suddenly if it's committed, it gets really hard. So what is the solution to this? Well, obviously the answer is, Zero knowledge proof of knowledge. And uh, you know, again, we can create in this special case what would be called a range proof, where basically I'm proving that a number, a committed number is positive. So Victor can check this uh, range proof and check that this committed value C actually commits to a value that is positive. And um, Another use case with zero knowledge proofs, or that, that you know, another case is, is zero cash. And what you do in zero cash, um, it's uh, zero cash has this additional property and it hides actually who is paying whom. And what we do here is we commit to all of the coins, all of the coins that exist. Just think of one dollar coin or one one D cash coin. It's a little bit more complicated, but all of them are committed to in sort of this data structure called a Merkle. Like you can also think of it just as a list, but the important thing is that they're encrypted, so no one can see what the value of each of these coins is. Are, is. And then I can uh, give you a zero knowledge proof of knowledge for this complicated statement. So basically what I'm saying is, I know two coins, right, two different coin values, uh, or just one, 
And I know some sort of, they are in this list. I'm not going to tell you which ones in this list there are, but I'm telling you that two of the coins in this list, I, uh, I have the private key to, so I'm authorized to spend them. And uh, they also previously, they were, they've not been spent previously. And here is a new coin that is an encryption or that is sort of a commitment to the sum of the old coins, right? So again, I need to check that for you have two new coins and the sum of the old coins is equal to the sum of the new coins. So there's no new money created. And, and again, well, but the beauty of the zero knowledge is that now a verifier is convinced that this is true and, you know, this is actually valid coins that were spent. You know, they don't reveal, we don't know which coins are spent. But uh, the verifier or the public learns nothing about which coins were spent. So the payer and the receiver are sort of completely hidden. There's no sort of linking between coins. In a, in a Bitcoin blockchain, I can see exactly, you know, one coin spends a previous coin, spends another coin. So the coins are perfectly linked together. This is the opposite. There's no linking about, like, I don't know the coin's history. I don't know which of the old coins this was. Um, so you get a lot of privacy from that. Um, so this hides the same as it was So um, what is the sort of what was before Bulletproof? What was the current state of the art for, for these kind of statements? Well, there were these proofs that um, were called like the Sigma protocols. They're related to the protocol that I showed you before. But you know, using that, they were about four kilobytes proofs. This is extremely large, or a bit pretty large, and uh, but they had the nice. Uh, and then there's this other proof system, which is called the SNARK, which um, sort of where the questions are first encrypted, um, and basically there's a trusted party that, right? Like we had these queries in these proof systems, right? These questions that got asked, and in the SNARK, what you have at a very very high level, you have a trusted party that computes these or that. that generates these questions, and then encrypts them in a special way, so the prover kind of read what the questions are, uh, and he also encrypts sort of the answers or the ways to check that the, these questions were answered correctly. And uh, the beauty of SNARKs is that you can actually compute, uh, using these encrypted queries, you can compute a very, very short proof. So the proof doesn't actually depend on how complex the statement is that I'm trying to do. Make. So the proof is just 288 bytes, or uh, actually no, 488 bytes, no matter what. Uh, and checking the proof takes 10 milliseconds, no matter what. So, um, yeah. So th does it mean that you need to have a third party that is trusted by both? Right? Yeah, well, especially it needs to be trusted by the verifier, right? Because what is the problem? Uh, say, you know, the, the third party is malicious, right? Say the prover Peggy and the third party uh, chief, well then the prover could actually tell uh, Peggy what the queries were, the unencrypted queries, and then Peggy could be able to cheat. So uh, the, 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 the person who creates the trusted setup can actually cheat. And what that means in a cryptocurrency setting is that uh, she could create money out of thin air, right? She can convince you, she could make a transaction that looks valid. You cannot tell whether it's, uh, it looks exactly like a valid transaction, but she's actually creating money out of thin air. So this is a gigantic problem, obviously, uh, because how do you get such a party that everybody trusts, right? Like, you know, you can try to employ a very trustworthy person, like, I don't know, Morgan Freeman or whatever, but, uh, you know, he's quite busy, so it's really a big problem for, for these systems, so because this, this Subverted setup, they could create fake proof. And uh, in the blockchain setting, this would mean inflation, right? And the problem is, because it's hiding, it would be even worse. It would be undetectable inflation. So zero cash could potentially have, uh, you know, they could they say there's like 20 million uh, zero cash funds. If their setup was broken, which I in no way believe, and I will give you a good reason why I don't believe that. Um, but if it was broken, then there could be billions of zero cash coins, and no one would be able to tell, right? Someone could just slowly sell them off and, and, and tank the price of zero cash, and it would be really detrimental and similar things. Um, 
And the problem is that even the fear of this undetectable inflation is dangerous. Because, you know, say people believe, oh, there's undetectable inflation. Well, there's really nothing that you can do to, to prove them wrong. You can say, no, the trusted seller was correct, but, you know, someone could be fear-mongering and saying, like, no, the trusted seller was broken. And there's really very little that you can do to prevent that. And the one thing that you can do, and where they spent a lot of effort and did a really good job to it, I can distribute this trusted party among multiple people. So in the first iteration, there were sort of six people of like very different uh, variety, and they ran this cryptographic protocol, and if only one of them is honest, like sort of, if they don't all six collude with each other, then everything would be fine. And now they're actually moving to a new version where they have more like, I think, more like 100 people uh, doing the setup. So if, if one of these 100 people is honest, then we're okay. So there's very little reason to believe that you know the six people will achieve it, and there will be even less reason to believe that the hundred people achieve it. But it's still very annoying. And one thing that is really, really annoying is that uh, every time they want to change sort of the functionality, every time they want to add some, you know, say Zeke had wanted to add smart contract, they would have to run a new trusted set. And you know, spend this is like a really complex ceremony. And there's actually a really good piece by uh, I think it's Planet Money uh, on NPR, which sort of you know uh, did a piece on, on the ceremony, and, and it's uh, it's really good. You should listen to it. What's and, the limiting factor there? Like, why stop at 100? Why not make it you know a million? Uh, because these hundred parties need to. Well, first you need to get a million people, but the, the uh, sort of these parties need to. It's like a pretty complex, like it, it takes like almost a day and there's sort of interactions, like people need to send messages to each other and uh, so it's a, it's a very complex uh, protocol. But like what they did is they developed a new one to be able to, like six was already pretty impressive, and then they developed a new protocol to be able to do like a uh, hundred or, um, yeah. But either way, uh, this is sort of, you know, the snarks have great properties, but sort of this, this trusted setup is still a very annoying property. Um, so we thought about like how can we, what can we do to um, have a proof system that achieves some of the similar properties, maybe uh, compromising some of them, but does not have this trusted setup. Because for example, like we talked to the core developers that came to us with this problem, they wanted to have, they wanted to sort of improve these confidential transactions. But just the setup for them was an absolute non starter cool. Like, um, right? It also, Zcash is a company, right? So there's a, a clear institution to be able to do that. In, in Bitcoin, this is much less clear, right? Who would be able to do that? So this builds on previous work from, from the University College London, and um, we don't want to go into technical details, but the important thing is that it only relies on the discrete log assumption. And what that means is that it is as secure as uh, sort of it is as secure as the signatures that are currently used in, in Bitcoin. It is as secure as smooth smooth signatures. So you sort of not adding like these snarks also have more sort of fancier cryptographic assumptions uh, that we're less sort of we know less about. And the discrete log assumption is one of the, the sort of most well studied ones. And it doesn't have the trusted setup, which is a great property. And what it also has, it has extremely short proofs. So the proofs aren't uh, constant size, like a 188 byte. But what they basically are, they're sort of logarithmic, the two log n to be specific, in this complexity of the state. And I will show you in a second what that means. Uh, and again, you can do you can do these range proofs with it to prove that a confidential transaction is correct. But you can also do these more complicated transactions. So you can do something like zcash with both. The reason why uh, the, the big downside is that the verification time for snark is constant, it's 10 milliseconds, no matter how complex the statement is. Uh, the verification time for bullet proofs grows linear with the complexity of the statement. So if I'm trying to convince you of a statement of an equation that is twice as complex, I will, it will take you twice as long to check the proof, even though the proof is short. And so uh, that is sort of the, the, the trade-off between both proofs and snarks. 
And, and, but what we can see is here, this is the old range group. And what we can see for a single range group, there's uh, uh, the, the, the size of the range group, which was four, previously 4 kilobytes, is now 670 bytes. And the nice thing is, say I want to do multiple range groups. So say my transaction has multiple outputs I'm sending to multiple people, there's a change address. But then the, the sort of the scaling gets better. This is, this is, I'm, I'm showing you a curve of a logarithm here. Say the transaction has 10 outputs, then suddenly the difference is between less than a kilobyte and uh, 39, 000, uh, 39 kilobytes. So uh, this is something, the important thing about this number is that uh, the, the sort of, you know, less than a kilobyte uh, is something that is probably acceptable for Bitcoin versus something that is in, you know, the tens of kilobytes is absolutely minimal. And, uh, well, we have this protocol where people can also combine their transactions to create a single transaction out of all of their transactions and just do one short proof for the whole transaction. And this will mean, again, you know, sort of shorter proofs for the whole uh, transaction. Um, skip over this. And, um, yes. well, in total, what this would mean is if, if sort of Bitcoin or, uh, yeah, Mimblewimble or Xbox switched over to confidential transactions, but the old solution, the, the UTXO set, which is sort of the state that the miners have to keep in memory, would be 160 gigabytes. And even if you don't assume sort of a change in usage, which you probably would, and which would make these numbers better, uh, with polar proofs is what only 17 gigabytes. And uh, well, Monero, who already has, which already has confidential transactions, uh, they actually came out and, and said that they will they will use polar proofs because it's just uh, you know it will bring down their transaction size by or, yeah, know, like a factor of 10 again, uh, which will reduce the fees and will improve the usability of, of Monero. So they said. I'm quite happy about this, but they said, uh, uh, is this? It works. Bottom line, they're awesome. They work. The fees are lower, and then we test it. So it's pretty cool. Like you know, the the so bulletproof within you know a couple, of, I think probably within a year, they will uh, you know secure one of the biggest uh, cryptocurrencies. And the. Other sort of, you know, maybe you've heard of these things called Starks, which is yet another proof system, uh, which also doesn't have trusted setup and has better, probably better verification time. But the problem with Starks is that the proof sizes are just sort of um, too large. They're like over 200 kilobytes, so not practical for the, uh, the, the blockchain applications that I've been talking about. They have other applications uh, in different settings where they're very interesting. Um, and yeah, we use this for Zcash, and, and we're, we're sort of we're talking with the Zcash team, uh, then you know, the transaction size would be about 1.3 kilobytes or less than, which is you know, bigger than Snarks, but probably still in the realm of you know, feasibility. The problem is that verifying a transaction would be about 10 times slower. So this is something that we're currently working on with the Zcash team to, to, to sort of figure out what the trade-offs are, but they're certainly interested in, in, in exploring this and, and perhaps moving away from Snarks uh, it's bulletproof, so we can further improve this especially. Um, I'll actually skip over this. Uh, uh, bulletproofs could also be used for smart contracts, right? Where you, you know, in a smart contract, want to prove something is correct, but again, without giving any sort of information about why this so I can, for example, prove to you that uh, my, like, you know, my bid in an auction was over some value, uh, over the value that you posted without revealing what my bid actually was. And so all of these applications are sort of interesting and, and both resort, again, because of their short size. And you know, what you have to remember is that in the blockchain, everything has to be sent to everyone. So everybody reads everything. So the size of transactions and this, is what, so this whole scaling debate is part of what this whole scaling debate in blockchain is about is that um, it's really difficult. Like the bigger the size of transactions and bigger the thing, the information that I have to send around, the more complicated it gets. Right? <coughs> like uh, 40 kilobytes are easy if I have to download it from a server, but 
suddenly everybody in the world needs to hear about it, then and there's thousands of transactions, then you know every is, is, is uh, the size of a single transaction suddenly becomes very important. So this is why we had this focus on having small proof sizes in in uh, proofs. And um, yeah, so I want to in the remaining time I want to uh, yeah we spend a bunch of time on improving the sort of the verification time, which is really the important thing. And at a very high level, it's, so one thing that we did is we sort of developed this algorithm that if you see two proofs, or if you see multiple proofs, it's easier to verify them than just like n verifying n proof is uh, is much easier than n times verifying one proof. And the reason why this is important is because say I'm a miner and I receive a block of Bitcoin transactions. And I want to check all of the proofs. Well, then, then I usually have to check them all at once, and I have to check them very quickly because I have to very quickly be convinced that all of the transactions in this block are whether this block is valid or not. And what this means is, like, what this comes down to is checking all of the proofs in the transaction. And it turns out that you know, in some certain settings, uh, checking all of these bullet proofs for confidential transactions would actually not be more expensive than checking, um, or it depends a little bit on the setting, but basically would not be more expensive than checking the validity of Bitcoin transactions right now. So sort of the, the, the important takeaway is that there are very, very few technical reasons anymore other than the complexity of a hard fork, which is extremely a big, big hurdle, but uh, then very few technical reasons anymore for Bitcoin to not move to confidential transactions. So if you sort of were redesigning Bitcoin from the beginning, you would probably, like, there would be a very good argument to be made to build it with uh, confidential transactions. And so this is uh, all proofs. And I want to very quickly talk about something called provisions, which is work that we did in a while ago now, this is a team. And so the question was, uh, right, we've talked about the blockchain, um, but the problem is what I've mentioned previously is that most people don't actually use the blockchain. They use the blockchain through the exchanges, right? It's Coinbase or something, and the exchange actually interacts with the blockchain. And this is true for many reasons, the main one probably being usability. Right? It's extremely difficult secure your own private key it is extremely difficult uh, to, you know, um, to sort of download the software, it's not very usable, and, and, and this is why many people you know, abstract that usability and use exchanges. And you know, I guess most people also use blockchains mostly for financial trading, so it's also nice that you have that uh, and an exchange for that. Reason. And they look a lot like online banks, because they kind of are banks. Um, they just very much like all that. Um, the problem is that they have a pretty bad track record, and it's gotten better in the recent years. But you know, there was this amazing study in 2013 that said that 50% of the uh, Bitcoin exchanges had failed. And you know, one of the the, the, the main examples, obviously, from Docs, where you know, 500 million dollars in then Bitcoin value was stolen. I yeah, I don't even want to know how much it is. Next value. Um, but there was sort of this question before Mount Gox went completely belly up, uh, are we solved, right? Like people were literally sitting outside of Mount Gox's office and asking that question, where is my money? Are you solved? Prove to me that you're solved. Like, and they were like, yeah, we are. Like, but sorry, we can't prove it. Um, so the goal in, in this work on provisions was that we want to enable an exchange to prove that they're solved. But what does it mean to be solvent? Well, it means that they, uh, the total liabilities, so the total number of the total amount of money that users have at the exchange, is less than their total assets, so the total Bitcoin assets that they control. That's pretty easy to define that. And the Bitcoin address is obviously the sort of the value is connected to this public ledger, which is the blockchain, right? So how can they do that? Well, the classical approach to do this is a trusted app auditor. So you have sort of this auditor come in and look at the books and say, it looks good to me. It turns out, actually, uh, Mount Gox did that, but 
And you know, also auditors are extremely expensive, right? And, you know, they, and uh, everybody needs to sort of trust that they are doing this correctly and, and aren't right or anything. And the other problem thing that you could do is you could publish everything. You know, you could say these are my Bitcoin addresses, and here this is the list of all my users and how much money they have. But obviously, right? Like no one would want that. No user would want that that the exchange publishes how much money they have at the exchange, um, and uh, they also don't want to, you know, see it, reveal it again. That's an important business secret: how much money they have in total, which Bitcoin addresses they control. So this is sort of a seems like a non-starter, quite natural. Uh, right, Maxwell came up with this protocol, um, which was sort of more cryptographic, where uh, basically, you use something called the Merkle trees, and it sort of solved one half of the problem. So users did not, the exchange did not have to reveal how much each user has. That was mostly hidden. Um, but the problem was the other side of the protocol, and you could check sort of that you were included in the proof of solvency. The problem is that the other side of the, you still had to prove that you had enough money. So the outcome of this one side was oh, the exchange has liabilities of, you know, 20,000 Bitcoin, and then, you know, they had to do the other side of the proof, and this time actually did this, um, uh, and sort of what they just did is, is exactly what we discussed before, they just sent money on the blockchain, right? This is, I think, you know, this came up in one of the early questions. So they, they just uh, sent $150 million on the blockchain. Uh, but you know this was not hidden yet, so everybody knew how much money they had exactly. So uh, this previous protocol was considered to leak it. Like Kraken actually came out and said that if they said Maxwell's proposal would require Bitcoin companies to reveal all the balance containing addresses, message which result in public knowledge of exchange wallets, provides Bitcoin wallets and total holdings uh, information that is sensitive and presents potential security risk to companies and users. So they were not willing to do this. So our goal was to improve on this protocol, and basically the Maxwell protocol where you get total liabilities, some information about account sizes, total assets, which addresses the exchange had, and we wanted to really make it real. None of that. And now comes the surprise solution. What did we use for that? Well, we used the zero knowledge. So um, again, amazingly, the same tool that we talked about for this whole talk can be used here. So um, right, I can actually prove to you that I'm rich, which is, uh, um, so how do we do this? Well, what I do is, at a very high level, how provisions work is I commit, sort of I do this cryptographic commitment again, sort of an encryption of how much my total liabilities are, and then I uh, give you proof that sort of all of the users were included in this proof of liability. So if you're not included. I commit to what my total assets are, and this total assets proof actually has to work together with the blockchain. And what you will do is sort of you name like a large set of addresses, like a million addresses, and you prove that you know the private keys to some of these addresses. And that this commitment is a commitment to the total balance at the addresses where you know the private keys. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you know you, you, you prove that you didn't include any of the addresses where you don't know the private key to, so the addresses that you don't know. But it's actually the sum, sort of this, the total liabilities, it's a commitment to, uh, the total assets is a commitment to the, the total money uh, uh, that you control. But the verifier, again, because it's a zero knowledge proof, knows that you control some of these addresses, but again, he has no idea which one of them. And you can choose your anonymity set to be uh, extremely large. We ran it with like kind of tens of thousands. Um, and the proof of solvency is just a proof that you know the commitment uh, of assets minus liability is a commitment to it, so that the assets are equal to the liability. Sort of right at equal. Uh, proofs of solvency, so this is great, and this is actually very practical. They do have some limitations. Uh, and the most important, uh, the two most important ones are that proof of solvency is a snapshot. You're solving at that second, but that doesn't mean that you're solving in the next second, right? Like you might then be hacked one second later. 
And the even more important one is that a proof of solvency means that I have enough money to pay out all of my customers. It doesn't mean that I'm actually willing to. So, and there's really sort of no, it seems like there's no inherent way to do that. Um, and, um, but, but there's, it also doesn't prove that you have sole control of this, of this right. It's, somebody could have stolen the right key but not through the transaction. Right, and it could even be that sort of, you know, you have a, the, the sort of at the same time, if you have a way of preventing them colluding, right? So not everybody would necessarily have to do, do that, and, and sort of for users to check that they were included, that is almost true. Um, so, again, like, I think that sort of the high level um, summary or that what I would like you to take away is that uh, cryptocurrencies, but they, you know, they have the word cryptography in them, but there's actually a lot of cryptographic tools that, that you know, Bitcoin, for example, doesn't really use. And these cryptographic tools are extremely powerful. And the beauty is you can do things with them that you would like to have in the real world, rather than the well, I'm saying real world, but like in the uh, classic financial system, I would like to know that my bank is solvent. I actually sort of know, and the only way you know I have is I can trust their auditors, but I would like them to provide a mathematical proof of solvency. But we can't really do that because there's no cryptographic public that. But with something like this blockchain, this is actually possible. So I feel like this is a pretty cool example of something that we would like in the in the classical financial world but can't do, but suddenly in the cryptocurrency world this is, is, is uh, possible. And um, yeah, and again, you know, there's the, the world of photography is, is somewhat magical, and there's, there's an amazing amount of, of cryptographic tools out there that are, enable you to do things that seem sort of impossible, but well, are actually possible. And, and one of them is already these technology technologies. So. Thank you very much. This is my, my website, the Bulletproof sort of website, and the Korean page. <laughs>
implementing it, using it, making sure that it's secure. So it's quite exciting. Can you talk a little bit about how the bulletproof and ZK stuff is able to not only hide the amount that I'm saying it's saying, but also say hiding the sender? Yeah, so it's, I mean, I guess this was, um, uh, this um, uh, so what was I saying? Um, so, well, the, the idea is that sort of, I, I have a list of all of the coins. I have a list of all of the coins, or, or a Merkle tree, which is a fancy list. Um, and basically, I'm able to, to prove to you that I know one of the coins uh, in that list, uh, or in that tree, but I'm doing this in zero knowledge. So I'm not telling you which one of them I know. So what you know, basically, after the fact, you're basically convinced that I spent a coin that was previously unspent, but you have no idea which one. And what this means is that transactions are, or coins are unlinkable. In, in Bitcoin, you can see the whole history of a coin. You can see, like, if I had it, then you can see where it came from, sort of, and you can trace it back to, to you know, which block it was mined from. Uh, because of this, this breaks the linkability. Because I'm just telling you I'm spending some coin, and you have no idea, uh, and here's a fresh new coin. So it appears out of thin air, but I'm proving to you that I did this correctly. Uh, but I'm not like I'm so the zero knowledge proof with, uh, breaks the linkability between the points, and this is what is what hides the sender and the receiver. A really interesting use case uh, where you discuss the interbank lending and interbank rate setting for fixed capital contracts. Yeah, and uh, again, right, like this would be something that would be nice to have in, in the uh, normal financial world, but. Uh, seems really difficult because we don't have this public ledger available. But uh, again, right, like, you know, the beauty of the zero knowledge group is that a public ledger, which is what a blockchain is, doesn't mean that there has to be, you know, all your information has to be on that ledger available in the clear. It doesn't mean sort of a, a clear or, or uh, that it could be in some ways transparent, right? You could have the information on the blockchain, but uh, it's only committed to in a cryptographic way. It's hidden but uh, I can still sort of do stuff with it using your knowledge. Do you need more signatures for other groups or uh, They are in some way independent. They rely on the same cryptographic problem or the same uh, sort of mathematical tools. Um, but yeah, they are, I guess, independent. So, so they could they could be able to on top of the other uh, yeah, they also use elliptic curves um, and actually a zero knowledge proof can, can act as a signature as well. So in some ways they could replace the signatures. Uh, which is like yeah, they, it's a little bit more difficult, but in member one this is exactly what would happen. The zero knowledge proof would replace the uh, signature. So you mentioned that ZK starts are um, from a from a space standpoint not very efficient. But what about the computation speeds? So uh, the verification time of, of our starts is, is, is so checking and proof is, is quite efficient, and they have other nice properties such that they sort of the cryptography that they use is, is more resistant to something called quantum computers, which doesn't exist yet, but might in some far future exist. Um, which bulletproofs or snarks are not. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the problem is that by now, the, and uh, there was a basic beautiful map, but by now the, the sort of the proof size doesn't make it possible to sort of post a stark on the blockchain. But you know, if you did something like what I talked about, like the blockchain compression, uh, if I like, I can give you a stark that sort of my blockchain was computed correctly. This might be a more uh, interesting use case for them. And you know, there's multiple proof systems out there. There's a lot of research going into this right now. And sort of one takeaway is that there's not really a clear winner, right? Like bullet proofs is not better than snarks, and snarks are not better than bullet proofs, or snarks are not, you know, they just have different trade-offs. You know, you have the trusted setup versus sort of slower verification time, 
and you know you have a little bit bigger proofs versus quantum resistance and yeah so there's it's a yeah um, uh, yeah, so I, uh, how, how does it work uh, when you have a, a cryptocurrency and every user has their uh, wallet, right, and it's encrypted? Only the user themselves have um, insight into the amount that they have. Um, and then you want to make a transaction from one user to, to another user, and you, you can't tell how much money they have. No, uh, you, you can you can you can prove that, uh, or you can get a proof that you know the sender has enough money to, to send. But how how do you then compute the um, the resulting balance? Um, well, so the the, the, the I guess uh, in Bitcoin works slightly different in that like on a technical level it works sort of you, you have multiple coins and they have different values. And you always spend the full coin, and then send it to uh, sort of two outputs. One that goes to so if I want to send you money, and I have one Bitcoin address with like five Bitcoin, and and I want to send you three Bitcoin, then I will send three Bitcoin to you, and I will create a new address. Oh, I can also send it to my old one, but I will create a new address uh, which I am going to send the two Bitcoin to. But this is still my address. So basically, I'm not. There's no sort of balance. This is slightly different in Ethereum, but uh, you just spend the whole coin. And so, what this means for in a confidential transaction is, I just prove that the input is equal to the output. So there's no sort of remaining balance. Does that make sense? Uh, I guess so. Yeah. Oh, I guess. Uh, <laughs> uh, for bullet proofs, is the implementation like? Do you need to write the code in high-level language or uh, in a constraint system to? Oh, the yeah, no, the like you know, there's it's uh, it's extremely low levels in the file. Uh, there's like sort of you know, um, I guess there's a lot of uh, work still be done to make these zero knowledge proofs easier to use. Uh, so right now, so you have to be dig into the weeds to create a zero knowledge proof for a second that you want. Um, yeah. will, will the zero knowledge have a big impact on the fees, do you think? On the what? On the fees, the minor fees, eventually. Um, well, so basically, what I was trying to say is that, so say zero cash is, is more complicated. So, well, I guess, like, I think that with the current, with, with Bitcoin and bull proofs, it wouldn't have, with confidential transactions, the impact on the fees would not be that high, which is sort of a beautiful, so this is the, the, the innovation of, of Bulletproof, is that sort of we've gotten to a point where the increase in fees is not uh, a problematic, would not be a problematic factor anymore. And uh, one thing that is sort of nice is that you know, right now, if the miners wanted, they could boycott a transaction that sends a very large value until it sends very large fees. If the transaction is confidential, then the miners are not able to sort of base the fees on, uh, on, on um, the transaction value. And this makes uh, censoring a lot harder, which, yeah. What would you say like the migration path like for getting bulletproofs on, on Bitcoin? Uh, I don't know. I don't think it will. I, I, you know, the current political environment in Bitcoin, it doesn't seem likely that they will do hard work. So I think it's much more likely that we'll see another sort of experiences. Um, so yeah, yeah. So uh, for, let's say, reporting requirements, is there a way the organization like the IRS would ever get views like, over what's going on? Because at the end of the day, we need to pay taxes on capital gains. Yeah, I mean, like one of the beautiful things. Is, so, so, but like, um, the IRS could not see how much the amount are on the blockchain, but they could. Uh, you know, what you can do is you can sort of in, in zero knowledge. I mean, what they like realistically right now, what they do is they sort of ask the exchanges, right, and uh, sort of control the in and outputs. Um, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting challenge. The, the, I think that again. In some ways, zero knowledge proofs could help here because what you could do is I can prove to you in zero knowledge that this is 
the correct amount of taxes that I'm supposed to pay, but I'm not going to tell you how it's sort of like contrived, like that it's made up of you know that much income tax, that much I don't know, wealth tax, or that much whatever. And this is not very realistic right now because you, it would mean that you would have to actually like one of the many technical challenges would be that there would have to be an exact specification of what the tax code is, and clearly there's not. Like right, like you would have to be able to write down the tax code in in like code, right? And, and it would be so sort of then like, but you know, laws and and, and even taxes have ambiguities, and uh, that obviously is yeah, that would be sort of one of the gigantic tactics. But in theory, there's nothing like at least at a very high level, there's nothing really stopping that. So, yeah, interesting sort of um, I don't know. We'll see what happens. Well, yeah, thank you very much.